Oh, hello and welcome YouTube, Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video on MathPace, of course. And as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you here today, as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. Step on inside, and we are on section 1.2 in the Big Ideas Math Book. 1.1 was on absolute value functions, and now today it is on piecewise functions in section 1.2. We'll start with a quick overview of the textbook lecture pages on what's involved, and then we'll go into the problem set, which has, I think, 55 problems. So let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at what we're doing here today. Evaluating piecewise functions. So piecewise function, and I believe I introduced the term in 1.1, it's a way of breaking apart a function into multiple equations. And the word function is going to be very important here, actually. It needs to satisfy the vertical line test. For one input, for every input, there can only be one output. And that's an important idea to this. So right here, for example, this can't be defined within a single function. It behaves this way right here and this way right here. There's a break. There doesn't have to be. But there's that change in behavior with this thing that can only be noted through a piecewise function sometimes. And this is one of them. Right here, this behaves like the line y equals x minus 2. If you think about that, here's the whole thing. But only across a certain part of the domain it behaves like that when x is less than or equal to 0. And then when x is greater than 0, basically everything to the right of the y-axis, then it behaves like this guy, y equals 2x plus 1. So you kind of see that break apart between the two. And it satisfies the entire real number domain. It carries everything. All real numbers are considered when x is 0 or less than 0, it's here. When x is greater than 0, it's here. And you do notice here that there's a closed circle on that guy, and there's an open circle on that guy. These are both on the y-axis. But an open circle, just like when you talk about a number line, is a way of saying that the point's not included. So for this to still be a function and hit the entire domain, we're saying when x is 0, it's not this point, actually. It's this one. So if x is less than or equal to 0, then you can do that. And what's nice about this is you can see on the graph what the y values become, or you can plug in your values for x, and it applies for both. So when we talk about evaluating a piecewise function, uh, is this for the above equation? It looks like it. For x minus 2, when x is 0, you plug it into the x minus 2 equation. Not this one, because it's not defined on that part of the domain. But then uh, when x is 4, we do use the x is greater than 0 equation 2x plus 1, and we plug it in, we get 9. So those are the ideas of it. And this piecewise function, this is something that you would try and do on your own. I'm, I'm going to save it because we have our own practice problems. But it, and, uh, for any number for x that's less than negative 2, such as negative 8, and it looks like that's it, um, you're going to plug in negative 8 into this equation, which there's no x here. This is the same as saying y equals 3 right here whoops, like y equals 3, and then y equals x plus 2, and y equals 4x. What would I plug into 4x for this? Anything when x is greater than 5, so not negative 8, not 0, not even 5, not negative 2, not 3, just 10. And 4 times 10 is 40. So things like that. That's how we work it. Okay, moving on forward, it's just yet another example of this thing. Uh, you see other different kinds of equations. If we have to graph our own, my recommendation is generally graph it as you best know how to with pencil and then erase the parts that you don't need that cover the domain. That's that's my big thing. So we'll see how that works. Um, now we'll see some differences in range this time. Uh, we saw on the absolute value equation that it's just at the vertex. But here we just got to see what's the bottom and what's the top of the thing. Domain for the most part, they're going to consider all real numbers for a lot of these equations. That's not always true. But I think we're going to like this one is left to right just like that. So anyway, that's just more on the piecewise function. You see more examples of it broken apart. And here's one that has like three of them, for example. You take a look at this one. So right here, it's behaving probably like y equals negative x minus 2 here, y equals 2 here, and y equals, looks like 2x, oh, hold on, 2x minus 3 right there, for example, and across different parts of the domain. So we're going to be sure to write a couple of them for ourselves. The last thing I want to cover is what's called a step function. It's a certain kind of piecewise function, only it has this step ladder appearance to it. So if you take a look, step by step by step by step, and it runs across a certain part of a domain. This looks like it goes from x equals 0 to x equals about 12. Not x doesn't equal 12, but from 0 to 12, we're covering this part of the domain, and there's a step ladder thing. These look a little different, but they have some real world application to them. Actually, pretty good one. It all depends on what you're talking about. Because if x is representing, say, time, for example, time can go on and you can be, have collected a certain amount of money, for example. But maybe you don't make the next bit of money until that next thing happens over that time. So it's like you make 
eight dollars per hour but you only make eight if you just work that time it's not like for the half hour you make half the money maybe you do in certain situations but it's there until the next thing like that i can think of other examples or they're going to have other examples with us but you can see where this step function is y equals two on this part of the domain y equals three on this part of the domain and then four and then five and what's interesting is you see that it is y equals two all the way up until it hits two and once it hits two then it jumps up to three x equals two then it jumps to y equals three and then once it hits four then it y equals four like that so it keeps moving forward um, okay, so that's kind of the look of it there. I'm going to go to some of the problem sets soon. I do want to jump to the first two couple of questions where they ask about concept checks, vocab and concept checks. Vocab, compare uh, piecewise functions and step functions. So I, you know, I'm just going to say that out loud. A step function is a certain kind of piecewise function. You know, a piecewise function isn't a certain kind of step function. So um, it's one with a prolonged list. It could be a very long list of it, step functions can be infinite. So it's a thing of if you're going to state every step across an infinite domain, it's just unreasonable. So step functions have that constant step ladder approach going from one to the next. They're generally even equal intervals that go up from one to the next on it. And that's what it is. Use a graph to explain why you can write the absolute value function, y equals absolute value of x, as a piecewise function. Well, you can because it behaves differently across two different parts of the domain but really across the all real number domain. So if you imagine that I had a little absolute value graph that just, you know, it looks like this right here, not very well drawn, at the vertex states the difference between what this part of the piecewise function can be. Maybe it's like y equals negative x plus four. And then maybe here it's like y equals x minus one or something like that, you know, and then it intersects at the vertex. On one part of the piecewise function though, you want to include this point. On the other part of the piecewise function, you don't. So imagine, Imagine that the piecewise function instead was consisting of this point here, boom, and then the other guy was here, but when you draw it separately, you technically have the open circle. So like this is when x is less than or equal to 3, and this is when x is greater than 3. So something like that. You cannot, well, you can because it's the same value. Um, you just can't have closed circles on two separate spots there. So it's, it's better to state that one is the or equal to and one is not. So anyway, we're going to move on to exercises 3 through, I think, 55. We'll take a look at that here in just a moment. So all these are piecewise functions, hopefully some less graphing than the previous one that we did. I'm going to use this workstation right here to be able to do all the writing. So hopefully you can follow along as we start this. Okay, exercises 3 through 12, we will evaluate uh, the function. We have f of x defined as 5x minus 1 and x plus 3 on these parts of the domain. g of x is negative x plus 4 here. 3 here and 2x minus 5 here. So depending on what we're substituting and which function we're using, f or g, looks like we do f for 3 through 6 and g for 7 through 12, then we will use that specific piecewise function across that specific part of the domain based on our input. So on number 3, we have f of negative 3. So f of negative 3, which means we have to substitute x, negative 3 for x, into one of these two parts of the function. Which one specifically? Negative three is less than negative two. So we're gonna substitute negative three into here. It would be incorrect to substitute negative three into there. So we're gonna be doing five times negative three minus one. Now I'm gonna speed this, these ones up over time if it makes sense, but that's gonna be negative 16 for that particular answer on number three. Number four, we have f of negative two. Now we substitute negative two in a particular one, so let's take a look at which one that should be. Is negative two less than negative two? No, it's equal to it, so we gotta use the one where it says greater than or equal to negative two. So we don't substitute it in five x minus one, but we substitute it into x plus three. So f of negative two is negative two plus three, which is one. Now these piecewise functions aren't graphed, but if you saw the graph, that's where you would see this point exist. This is basically where you have the closed circle on negative 1 and an open circle on whatever negative two, uh, on negative 11. Negative 2 times 5 minus 1. That's how that works. Number 5, same thing, f of 0. It looks like these next three we're going to do with x is greater than or equal to negative 2. So we're going to go ahead and do that with that particular portion of the piecewise function for these next two. f of 0 is 0 plus 3, which is 3. That's number 5. And then number 6, we have f of 5. We continue on that one. So we're going to do 5 plus 3. And without showing any work this time, that's going to be f of, what is that, 5, that equals 8. 
So those are the first four that we tackle within just that set. The next ones look like we will be using g of x, so we can kind of ignore the f equation, but there are three portions of the domain that we have to cover this time for g of x. So we hit number seven and we have g of negative four. Now generally, if because I'm guessing this assignment is going to ask us to write our own piecewise function, it's best, and I can't see a time when they wouldn't, it's best when you write your piecewise function to go from the leftmost x values to the rightmost x values. So notice they say x is less than or equal to negative one, that's the farthest left that we go. x is between negative one and two, that's the next set. And then x is greater than or equal to, to two is the next set. So go from left to right makes it easier for you to find. So g of negative four is going to be less than or equal to negative one. That's opposite of negative four plus four, which is eight, okay. Number eight, g of negative one, let's find that. That's where, that's still on the left one. Less than or equal to negative one, negative one's included, so we will go ahead and do that. G of negative one, G, uh, is opposite of negative one plus four, which is five. And then we hit number nine, G of zero, that's between negative one and two. Now notice neither negative one or two are included in the set of the domain, but zero is properly in between them, so we're going to use it. And the answer is three. There's nothing to substitute for x. It's just a constant function at that point. So nothing else to do other than say three. So anything in between negative one and two, uh, exclusive, non-inclusive is three. G of one is between there as well. So number 10, what's G of one? That's also three. Just, there's, there's nothing to plug in for x. It's like saying zero x plus three. That's what makes it a constant function. It doesn't change no matter what you substitute for x. G of two, now we are greater than or equal to two. So we got to substitute to the next one, 2x minus 5. 2 times 2 minus 5. 4 minus 5 is negative 1. And lastly, g of 5. Let's do that one kind of in our head, but I'll write it out. 2 times 5 is 10. Minus 5 is 5. So g of 5 equals 5. And that's the way that piecewise functions work in a nutshell. That's, that's our basic thing. They'll probably get more challenging, and we'll probably use some more things with graphs later. Okay, 13, looks like some word problem-ish thing. Uh, on a trip, the total distance in miles you travel in x hours is represented by the piecewise function. Okay, so this basically, is this hours for d, uh, for x? Yeah, how, how far do you travel in four hours? Oh, it says x hours, okay. So that piecewise function, they have d of x equals, boom, boom. So this one's kind of nice as far as this thing goes. What it imagines, I assume, is you're driving 55 miles per hour for the first two hours, and then the next three hours you kick it up to 65 miles per hour. The minus 20 is just a way of making sure that these two equations probably line up, right? So it goes from here to there, if I actually drew it, which I'm not going to. It says, how far do you travel in four hours? Now that's kind of an interesting bit because these, it, it, it's asking a bigger question than this. Um, if you drive 55 miles per hour, then you drive 55 miles in one hour, right? That's the idea. So in, I, I'll, I'll kind of make this like a table. In hour one, after hour, let's see. In hour one, you've, after hour one, you've driven 55 miles per hour. Uh, by hour two, you have completed another 55, which is 110 miles. Okay. Um, the next three hours you drive 65 miles per hour so oh you know what i'm sorry you don't have to add those things up do you let's see how far did you travel no you don't have to add those things up i apologize for that but that's that's how that thing would work right anyway uh let's just do that 65 d of i can't believe i thought of that d of four i thought you had to add the things up d of four is 65 times four minus 20. If you guys don't know by this point, I sight read these. I haven't seen them beforehand. 260 minus 20 is 240. So you'll have traveled 240 miles. Basically, you got to substitute it at the right mile uh, hour mark to get the right mileage based on it. And you might wonder, you know, the 55x part is considered within it. That's the part that you traveled. And that's why this equation is specifically the way that it is. So that still does work out. Okay, number 14. So now that I know, that's not more complex than it needs to be. The total cost in dollars of ordering X custom shirts is represented by the piecewise function here. Determine the total cost of ordering 26 shirts. So let's see if this bottom has to do with anything or if it's just a menu. Uh, it kind of is. It's, it's saying if you 
buy between zero to 24 shirts, they're gonna pay $17 per shirt. 25 to 49 is 15.80 per shirt. 50 plus is 14 dollars per shirt basically a way of incentivizing you to buy bulk and not you know oh plus a 20 dollar processing fee that's why you have to plus 20 on all these all right uh 26 shirts that's between 25 to 49 shirts so if we're going to do we're going to do c of 26 which is going to be 1580 uh, times 26 plus 20 and this is a time where we have to go to a calculator. I don't have it set up. I might pause it next time if we have to do it more. Let me get one off my phone. I'm just doing that basic calculation so I won't show it to you. That is $430.80. Now, from the last two problems, the important thing to note is units. Make sure you include units in your answer. So total cost is going to be $430.80. Okay, we move on to the next set. We have number 15. Graph the function, describe the domain and range. So let me grab a graph item. Give me one. Okay, I will pause. Give me one second. Okay, let's see. So we're going to graph these two things. So the way that I was kind of describing it before is you might want to graph it kind of in full. Not, not necessarily in full, but you want to make sure that you hit the y-intercept on some of these if you have trouble with that. In the most part and then go as far as you need to before you need to stop or erase what you need to if you go past it too much so let's see if I can kind of show you in these ways so we're gonna graph it as y equals negative X when X is less than 2 so let me just kind of draw a line right here to start this is the separation between where your piecewise function does things differently to the left versus the right at X equals 2 so y equals negative X y equals negative X is the same thing as y equals negative 1 X plus 0 so the y-intercept is zero, and it's a up one, left one kind of line like this. But we also go down one over here. And this says x is less than two. So at two, we're going to have an open circle there, basically. Okay, that's the end of that portion of the domain, but then it goes forever to the left in this direction, for example, right? So I'll make sure to draw the thing with arrows, and let me get that kind of farther upward. Okay, so if I were to draw this with lines, we got arrow blue. And I'll keep using blue for the other side as well. So there's that part. Okay, now on the other side of this, we have y equals x minus 6. This is when x is greater than or equal to 2. Now this is where I recommended that if you have trouble kind of drawing graphs outside of using your y-intercept, like I sometimes do, then you start with that. But I would draw it lightly and with a pencil. So x minus 6 is 1x minus 6. So I would start at this negative 6 y-intercept, and I do up 1 over 1 a couple times until I hit here. This says when x is greater than or equal to 2, which means these parts don't even really count. I don't need to draw that as part of the line. This was just to help me get here. The rest of the way, I'm going to have that slope of 1, up 1 over 1 going up, you know, like this. And I don't need this big line that was to show you the separation. So let me erase these two dots here. Let me get rid of this line here, and let me continue the path of this part of the equation and this will help be my piecewise function. So this line like that ends up being it. And that is our piecewise function. So this applies both parts of it and we considered both. Now when I do erasing, it's for the parts that aren't actually part of the domain. Okay, so that is number something, number 15. Um, number 16, you know, we're gonna do more of the same. So I'll just keep repeating over and over that thing. So, Number 16, 2x if x is less than or equal to negative 3, and negative 2x if x is greater than negative 3. So this might end up being like an absolute value equation, I think. Uh, 2x, that's 2x plus 0. Okay, when x is less than, less than or equal to negative 3. So here's what we're going to do. i got to start it there, and I want to go backwards. I'm going to go left to begin with. So, because i got to hit to negative 3. So down 2, left 1, down 2, left 1, down 2, left 1. And boom, this is the start of that graph that I need. So let me get rid of these. I don't want those there. Let's keep going down to left one here. And that's the left side of my piecewise function that way. Now, when x is greater than negative 3, it behaves like negative 2x. Okay, then that's, yeah, that, uh, no, that's not a piecewise function. Uh, excuse me, 
that's not an absolute value function then. So what I'm going to do, that's negative 2x plus 0. So here's a point on the graph. I go up 2 left 1, up 2 left 1, and up 2 left 1 again, here's negative 3. It doesn't include negative 3 here, so we will do an open circle, and then we will continue down back on this in this direction. So hopefully that idea is making sense. It'll allow me to speed up over time. It looks like you know they're going to do three piecewise functions and such and such. But that's the idea behind it and how I'm treating it, why I might do some erasing here and there. Hopefully it's making a little bit of sense. Make sure you have your arrows, your open and closed circles properly. So that way when x is negative 3, we hit this point and not that point. All right, number 17. Negative 3x minus 2 on one side of negative 1, including it. And on the other side of negative 1, x plus 2. And remember, they're going to keep doing it the same way, where it's the left is the top value and the right's the bottom value. Okay, negative 3x minus 2 when x is less than or equal to negative 1. So up 3, left 1 is this point here. This is where negative 1 exists. So this is my first closed circle. Let's get rid of the y-intercept value. And you don't need it if you can just use a pencil and point at it, you know, but maybe you don't know where it starts. Some people draw both lines completely and then they erase the parts they don't need until they're done. Just make sure you do it lightly if so. And use a ruler um, or a line tool. So up three left one over and over. And then on the other side, x plus two, if x is greater than negative one. So here's two. Now when we go down one and left one, that's part of your one slope, we would technically have an open circle here because negative one's not included. But because it's the same value that's defined on the other thing, drawing an open circle doesn't make sense. So even though it's not defined on this part of the function, it is defined within the domain on that point. So we still keep it there. You don't draw an open circle if it's included. But we do continue in this direction. And this mimics the concept of an absolute value function, except in terms of symmetry. So is this a true absolute value function? No. Does it V off like one, almost like a vertex? Yes. Can you call it a vertex? I don't think so. It's definitely not an, I can't make an absolute value function out of it. Okay, number 18. Oh, domain and range. I'm sorry, I need to go back to a few problems if that's okay. Let me go back. Um, was this 15? Okay, number 15. So the domain is all real numbers. And like I said, you're going to expect that a lot for piecewise functions. Maybe for some of the step functions, perhaps not, because we saw one that wouldn't work. The range. Okay, let's talk about this just for a brief moment, see if it makes some sense. The lowest value within this range is negative 4. Okay, so it's going to be some version of that. The question is, is there any point above negative 4 that's not hit? And I know people sometimes have trouble with domain and range and the idea. This goes forever left and right. Every x value is hit on this domain. The range, nothing below negative 4 is hit. Negative 4 is hit. Is anything up here not hit? Some people might say negative 2. And I, and I say, no, negative 2 absolutely is hit. It's hit right here. You see, this is the point 4 comma negative 2. So it's hit. It exists. Just because it doesn't exist here doesn't mean it doesn't exist here. And then there are parts like at 2 that it hits on two places. Does that matter for range? No, it just needs to hit at least once and then you're good. So it hits everywhere above negative two. If you said negative two doesn't work, I show you that right there it does. So this range is y is greater than or equal to negative four. So keep in mind, the open circle bit doesn't apply. It doesn't count for anything unless it represents an extreme or it's not touched at all in any sort of situation. So there are different things we might have to write all depending on the problems. On number 16 again, uh, so this so this is a good example. The highest value that we potentially try and hit is 6. It doesn't hit 6, but it goes down forever from there. And whether or not it hits these points, it still goes down forever. So the domain being all real numbers, once again, the range in this case is y is less than 6, not equal to because of the open circle. And then number 17, this thing kind of in that vertex way, the lowest value we hit is one. So with the domain of all real numbers, we do have a range of y is greater than or equal to positive one. Just goes up from there. Okay. All right, now we move on to number 18. Apologies for that. I need to make sure to read the instructions again. Okay, so um, when x is less than four, we're at x plus eight. So eight is right here. I, uh, this kind of goes off the map, sorry. Up one over one, up one over one 
up one over one and at four we get an open circle so imagine that that's y equals 12 way up there okay and then we continue in that direction I'll just use the line tool this is where I get to play a little speed up with it so there and then 4x minus 4 here's negative 4 and up 4 over 1 up 4 over 1 up 4 over 1 and up 4 over 1 I guess that hits 12 there again boom and then it takes off there so I don't this graph isn't fantastic for visual sake on my window range and I apologize for that but this keeps going up 4 over 1 from here and it does hit that point okay now remember domain and range domain is all real numbers it goes forever left and right and range looks to be all real numbers as well it goes forever down it goes forever up there's no leap gap or open circle because we closed it off as it hit that same value at x equals 4 okay number 19 now we have three different portions of the domain to cover piecewise function with so the first part is when x is less than negative 3 and it's at y equals 1 y equals 1 is just a constant horizontal line um, so at negative 3 y equal well it doesn't equal but this is where we draw our open circle at y equals 1 and then it goes forever left as y equals 1 to the left side so there's the first part of this piecewise function the next part is uh, drawn as x minus 1 between negative 3 and positive 3 and they're included on both so we'll do a closed circle so x mi so minus 1 and down 1 over 1 down 1 over 1 down 1 over 1 up 1 over 1 so here's positive 3 for x and negative 3 for x and those are the two in-betweens no arrows here this is the in-between portion so let's just connect the dots the three ones are fun and the last one is negative 2x plus 4 if x is greater than 3 so I'll start at 4 down to right one, down to right one. Wait a second. Down to right one, down to right one, down to right one. So right here, x greater than three. So open circle. Let's keep going down to right one from there. And there you have this guy. Okay. So that covers it. Uh, whoops, I need an arrow. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about domain and range. The domain still seems to be all real numbers. I mean, you can look at your equation and ask yourself, is there an x value that's not considered? What are all the x values less than negative 3, between negative 3 and positive 3, and greater than 3? Everything. Every number was considered. Uh, range could be a different story, and it looks like it is. Sorry, that's a very <laughs> bad-looking domain. The D itself was bad. All right, the range. What's the highest y value we hit? It looks like 2. The highest y value we hit was 2. It hits everything down below it. It hits, don't say it doesn't hit 1, it does right here. Don't say it doesn't hit negative 2, it does right here. It hits everything down below and it goes down forever. So the range is y is less than or equal to positive 2. Okay, every y value there is hit. All right, and then number 20. All right, number 20, y equals 2x plus 1 if x is less than or equal to negative 1 let's just go straight into that here's 1 down 2 left 1 and here's the start of negative 1 so we'll close off the circle there let's go down 2 left 1 again and again and just kind of start drawing this I need my arrow tool onto this one like that okay um, <clears throat> between negative 1 and 2 we're at negative x plus 2 so boom boom so we got to get to negative 1, uh, negative x plus 2. So slope of negative 1, up 1, left 1, open circle on that. It doesn't include that value. And then we go down 1, right 1, and down 1, right 1. We don't include that point either because x has to be less than 2. And that's the tweener. Close our open circles and no arrows. And then negative 3 if x is greater than or equal to 2 so 1 2 negative 3 right here and then we go forever right that's y equals negative 3 a horizontal line to the right like that there we go so hopefully this piecewise function stuff's making sense whether you go from graph and I don't think we've written a function from a graph yet right so let's see if that shows up I don't know uh, the domain still looks to be all real numbers again the range the highest value we hit is three 
and you can almost argue it goes down forever, but you notice this gap between zero and negative one. Now includes negative one, doesn't include zero. So the range has two different parts. All right, there's one part here that's between zero and three, right? We go from zero to three on y. Uh, that's one part of it. We don't include them. Okay, so that's one portion. And there's another portion even before it, if you will, because I, I call it, consider lower before it, um, that's less than negative one, less than or equal to negative one, because it goes everything downward from there. There's then a split in the range from that. And I apologize if I'm not writing that part correctly. I might have to put the union symbol, the U. It just is this or that. Um, but that's everything within the range. That's a semicolon, by the way. Um, so yeah, that seems to apply as long as I graphed it correctly. Okay, so those are those problems there. Let's move forward to the error analyses. All right, describe and correct the error in finding f of five when f of x equals. I'm guessing they substituted in the wrong equation. Let's see. Um, 2x minus 3 if x is less than 5 and x plus 8 if x is greater than or equal to. Yeah, so when x equals 5, they should have substituted into this equation instead. So as far as that analysis goes, we just go ahead and say for number 21, they substituted into the incorrect um, part of the domain uh, uh, expression. And yeah, so I'm just going to say that they should have substituted into the other. Oh, the reason is because x only is less than 5 in that scenario, not also equal to. So let's correct it. We should be doing f of 5 equals 5 plus 8, which equals 13. Uh, number 22, describe and correct the error in graphing this guy right here. Might have to do it with open closed circles. Let's see. So x plus 6 if x is less than or equal to negative two, so five, six right here, down one, left one, down one, left one. It needs to be also equal to, so they should have a closed circle. I'm just gonna correct it right here. They should have a closed circle here and greater than negative two. They drew the lines correctly, but this should be an open circle there and a closed circle there. Closed circle implies that it includes the point. Open circle, it doesn't. So hopefully you're good with me even um, just saying that and not writing it. All right, let's go ahead and move forward. Let's look at numbers 23 to 30, where we write a piecewise function for, for the graph. So here's where we're going to be doing the writing portion of it. Number 23. So here's what we say. Um, I assume these are f of x's, which is fine for us to do. So f of x equals. There are two portions of it, so we're going to break it apart. Let's start with the leftmost portion. So the leftmost portion is where we are. Um, and here's the part where you can decide because it's shared, a shared point here. Do you want to say less than zero or less than or equal to zero? You can do either. I'm just, you know, saying, so I will choose one. Um, and then just make sure you know how the line works. So this line behaves like y equals x plus two right there. So we're going to say x plus two when x is, I'll say, less than or equal to zero. So it's included for that. Now this time we're going to do everything when x is greater than zero on this portion of the domain. And it looks like it behaves like y equals two on this side. So y equals two when x is greater than zero. That's an example of a piecewise function you can do. Number 24, still broken apart into two. On the left side, left, left of zero, but including zero this time. This one, it's for sure a closed circle on that and then an open circle on the other one. It behaves like y equals negative three. So we'll say it equals negative three when x is less than or equal to zero, for sure, for sure. And this time x is for sure greater than zero where it behaves like that's y equals uh, plus three for the y-intercept and down one, two, three over one. So negative three x plus three when x is less, uh, excuse me, greater than zero. Okay. All right, let's move to number 25 where we have two broken apart, but you have to work a little bit harder to come up with some of these equations if they're not on the y-intercepts. Uh, that's what we saw in the previous one. Now to the left of it, we're saying to the left of four, it behaves like slope is negative one, so negative one x, negative x plus zero. It crosses at the origin, so negative x. So we'll say y equals, f of x equals, negative x when x is less than four, and then when x is greater than four, here's where you gotta kind of do some tracking on it. Can follow the slope, up one over one, up one over one here, until you hit positive one. So that's y equals negative x plus one, 
when x is greater than or equal to 4. So that's kind of how that works. Do the tracing for yourself, continue into the direction because they erased it. We, if we're going to write it, we need some slope intercept form version. We're probably not writing these as point slope form. Okay, number 26. Um, to the left and right of negative 2, and you can choose which one is the equal to, right? This time I'll choose the, I'll just say less than 2, uh, negative 2, excuse me, on this side, and greater than or equal to negative 2 on that side. So let's see. Um, on the left side, though, we got to do some tracking. So up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. Oh, they're being tricky because you can't see it in the window. But what's up 2 from 0? It's 2 and over 1. So the slope is 2. The y-intercept is 2. That's y equals 2x plus 2 when x is less than negative 2. And I just chose. I just decided this will not include it, and this one will. On this side here, it looks like 1 over 2 slope, 1 half and a y-intercept of negative 1, so y equals 1 half x minus 1. And that should be it. OK, 27. Now we have three portions of the piecewise function. So you need room for three of them. Go from left to right still. So the leftmost one is a constant. That's going to be 1 y equals 1 when x is less than or equal to negative 2. The next one, it goes between negative 2 and 0 on x. It doesn't include negative 2. It does include 0. So as far as this part goes, we write it as a compound inequality. x is between negative 2 and 0. We include the 0 portion. This slope is a rise 2 run 1. The y-intercept is 0, so that's just 2x. And the last one, let me fit it. The last one is y equals negative 1 half x plus 2, down 1 over 2. Uh, negative 1 half x plus 2, and that's greater than 0. And that hits the entire domain when we do that as well. So those are your three. All right, 28. Three of them again. The first one looks like a slope of 1, and it's going to hit up a y-intercept of 4. And we'll check that part of the domain. I didn't check yet. But that's 1x plus 4. That is to the left of negative 1, including negative 1. Between negative 1 and positive 3, between negative 1 and 3, not including either by the open circle, we are going down 1, right 4. Down 1, right 4. Now the tricky part of this one's the y-intercept. So down 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. Tricky part's the y-intercept. So think about this. Excuse me. If you go down one to right four, then that means every time you go over one, you're going down a quarter of it, you're going down a quarter of the way. So that's just one quarter down, right? One quarter, two quarters, three quarters, four quarters. So the y-intercept is negative one-fourth there. So this is negative one-fourth slope and then minus one-fourth y-intercept on that part of the domain. The last one is another, uh, it's a constant that is negative three when x is greater than or equal to three. Okay. All right, number 29 looks like one of those step functions. Um, it's three constants with equal interval amounts, but it's only three of them, so we don't have to write a massive set. Looks like number 30 is the same. So on number 29, these are all constants. On one set of the domain, x equals negative 5. Excuse me, y equals negative 5. On another set, y equals negative 3. And on another set, y equals negative 1 with equal increments. So we're going to say, let's write those first negative 5, this, this goes from left to right, negative 5, negative 3, negative 1. What parts of the domain? This is when x is between negative 5 and negative 3. Notice that negative 3 is not included. Then negative 3 is included here up to negative 1, which is not included. And then negative 1 is included here up to 1, like that. So that should be the step function. And I assume that would continue in the same kind of way. OK, last one's number 30. Now we have four of them as a step function, but they're still constants. And that's what step functions do. So number 30, <clears throat> we have four of them. We have y values of 4, 3, 2, and 1. 4, 3, 2, 1. The x values go between 0 
and 1, and then 1 and 2, 2 and 3. I just want to make sure I'm doing that right. 2 and 3 and 3 and 4. So see if that's kind of making sense with regard to what parts of the domain it hits, which ones are included and not, and all that. Okay. How's our time so far? 40 minutes. Not bad. All right. Hopefully more than halfway done, though. All right, graph the step function, describe the domain and range. All right, these look like, oh, they are, I was going to say, these look like step functions. They literally said step function. All right, these should go kind of faster because I don't have to do all the, I'm probably not going to use the line tool if it's in between, not too far. So we're at 3, 4, 5, and 6 on these parts. From 0 to 2, we hit y equals 3. Now we include, if you notice here, the less than or equal, the, these ones right here are included on the left part of the step function. So they'll look more like these ones here and not these ones here. So we'll have closed circles on the left, open circles on the right, if that makes sense. So y equals three from zero to two. And these will, the other nice part about these is they tend to follow a pattern and I assume that they will. And if they don't, then I don't think it's a true step function. I don't know. So from zero to two, y equals three, like that. From two to four, y equals four. So my guess without even looking is it's going to be five right here and six right here, let's see if it is. So it says five and six, and from four to six, and six to eight, awesome. Okay, and maybe I can fit all these on the same graph. Um, I'll go ahead and just keep moving on though. Number 32, all right, number 32, we have negative four, negative six, negative eight, negative 10, from one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five. So when x is one, we're at negative four, it's an open circle, and then one to two. There's a closed circle right here, and then negative six here, and negative, let me turn down this volume, I'm getting notifications that I don't need. Um, negative eight, and negative 10. Is that right, up to five? Yeah, that looks good. There's another step function. Those are small steps to go down. That's steep, like at the uh, top of a stadium. All right, number 33, 9, 6, 5, 1. Oh, that's not equal increments. I guess they still call it a step function, though. I mean, it makes sense as far as their flat steps and all that, all the jumps. All right, 9 from 1 to 2. So not including 1, but yes, including 2, we have 9. Now 6 from 2 to 4. So down at 6 from 2, not included, and 4 is included. Five from four to nine. Uh, four to nine. Nine's included. And then one from nine to 12. Now, 12 isn't truly on here, but 10, 11, 12. Sure. That looks good. I don't trust stairs of that variety quite that much, but that's the graph. So, yeah, a lot of step functions don't look like that. Because, you know, like I, I kind of mentioned why they might look like they do, because of the nature of a. Um, you know, like you're paid an hourly amount or something like that. So, I don't know. You know what's a good example of it instead of you being paid something? Um, a subscription. So, if you pay, you know, $20 a month for whatever, you've paid 20 for the month and then you forgot to cancel it and then that next day comes and boom, they renewed. So, they added another $20. So, $20 for the entire month and then to the next thing, it just paid, right? You don't pay $10 for half the month. That's a good example. All right, number 34, um, negative two between negative six and negative five. So here's negative six, uh, negative five, right, negative two, excuse me. So negative six is included, negative five's not. And then y is negative one from negative five to negative three. And then zero from negative three to negative two to negative two, yeah. That's an open circle on um, that one. And then one from negative two to zero. That's an open circle right there as well. Okay, so those are the four different step functions that we hit. They might have more questions on step functions later as we hit them. Okay, number 35. The cost to join an intramural sports league is 180 per team and includes the first five team members. For each additional team member, there's a $130, uh, excuse me, $30 fee. You have to, you plan to have nine people on your team. 
write and graph a step function that represents the relationship between the number p of people on your team and the total cost of joining the league. So number of people on your team is the independent variable. The cost, I guess, we'll use c. So we can call this like a c of p equation, cost based on number of players. So we'll do a step function here. So what, what's it looking like? It's $180 per team. So straight up, you're going to pay $180 no matter what happens. <clears throat> and then you start adding players and something happens. Um, for each additional team member, there is a $30 fee. So, oh, it includes the first five team members. Okay, so the first five team members, you're paying $180 flat, whether you have one person or five people like that. So between... Um, do we state, do we, I'm trying to decide if we say from zero to five, it's not really continuous. It's more discrete because these are people, but that's okay. So I'll say, so I'll say from zero to five here. I don't know if that's the best way of saying it. <clears throat> they might even say less than or equal to five straight up, but you can't have negative people. So I don't know what that best part of the left bound is. I'll just go ahead and say that. They might even say one to five. I don't know. But it's $180 from there. And then there's a $30 fee after that. Now, that's $30 per person. So somewhere we include this 30p. But what we have to be careful of is we have to start adding 30 from 180 after it hits the 180. So when it comes to, let's see, what do we have to do? We have to write and graph. The graph might actually help us here, almost more so than writing the step function to start. And I'm not going to use my other scale thing. I'm just going to kind of make up my own. So, you know, we start for the first five people at like this $180 line, if you will. So from here to here, this is all, this is going to be my graph. This is the $180 mark up to five people. So one, two, three, four, five. Now, when you hit six people, that sixth person is a $30 fee on top of it. So it's like, okay, boom, your price hiked up for the sixth person to here. We have to add 30 from that. But we have to make the equation that works properly so that it hits some y-intercept. So what's this point here? This is going to be important. This point is 5, 180. Now what happens when you drop 30 each person? Because we're going to simulate this line. I'm not doing it to scale. But what happens when you drop 30 each time you lose a player? Four, four players, because this isn't true, but four players is 150. Three players is 120. 2 is 90, 1 is 60, and 0 is 30. So this equation is 30p plus 30. That's the one that allows you to hit this part. Boom, right there, onward. So that happens, you plan to have 9 people on your team. So I'm guessing that's saying that up to 9 people this is going to work. So this graph is going to go up to here, 6, 7, 8, 9 players, like that. 7, 8, 9. And... So that's going to be from five players to nine players like that. And we want to say it kind of like that, if that makes sense. Um, at nine players, how much, this isn't perfect, but how much is that going to be? Uh, 30 times nine is 270 plus 30 is 300. So that top part's 300. So that's kind of a rough idea of the graph and what you're doing with it. Um, you have to come up with the equation based on it. And my graph helped me come up with each part of the piecewise function. And this is P and C. Okay, is that it? I think so. So the total cost is 300, right? $300. Okay, number 36. The rates for a parking garage are shown. Write and graph a step function that represents the relationship between the number X of hours a car is parked in the garage and the total cost of parking in the garage for one day. So we look at the sign that's on here. $4 per hour, $15 daily maximum. So once you hit $15, is it that you can stay there and park and you can just stay there for, for $15? I just want to make sure that you get to keep staying parked. Hold on. Because normally they don't say that. Normally it's the other way around. You would say like some for some number of hours is your limit. So daily maximum. Okay. Um, I'm going to make the assumption that you get to stay parked in there and once you've hit a certain amount you just get to like that's all you have to pay at that point they won't make you pay more after that so up front you start paying some and once you hit a certain time you kind of stop um so they said x and i'll just use f of x 
So this is going to be a piecewise function. Now to begin with, right, if you don't park in there at all, you're not paying anything. So zero. And then $4 per hour. If X is the number of hours, then you pay four X dollars for those hours, but only up to a certain amount. Now this part we don't quite know yet. And I'll, I'll kind of tell you why in a second, but we do it up to a certain point. This is uncertain because you need to plug in a certain X value so that right when it hits $15, then you're not paying that anymore. So there's a certain X that does it. Which one? We'll find out. But we're going to do 15 from that point onward and only 15, not 15 X, but just that. So that's when X is greater than or equal to whatever that amount is. So how do we find that out? Well, graphing might help and just that understanding. So that's why I said, you know, it's like a when in doubt, draw it out kind of scenario here. So we start by doing, you know, one hour, you pay $4 here. Two, two hours, you pay eight. Three, we pay 12. And four, you know, you don't pay 16, but let's, but let's get that idea down. So if we go like boom, 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 what we have to do is figure out that 15 here because there's a certain part where it flattens out at 15. It's kind of like, you know, kind of like that, right? Whether it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours, all that kind of stuff, you're only gonna pay 15 the rest of the way. So envision, that your graph kind of does this, but it doesn't include this part, right? We have to erase this. It's not a function anymore. You don't pay both $15 and $16, the four hour mark. You only pay that much. So what's the idea here? Is 15 is three quarters of the way from 12 to 16, right? 13, 14, 15, 16, three quarters of the way. So that value is at essentially three and three quarters because three quarters of the way from three to four is three and three quarters or 3.75 or if you use an improper fraction 15 fourths I think I think I want to use 3.75 for this one just to kind of mention that if you have trouble with that I'll show you another way to, to do this mathematically algebraically you have to figure out when 4x equals 15 when does this part of your y equals equation equal this part of your y equals equation whoops when does 4x equal 15 divide it by 4 and you get x equals 15 fourths or 3.75 or 3 and 3 quarters. Any of those will apply, but that seems to be the idea here. And generally I'm not a decimal fan. Word problems kind of seem to work better sometimes. Um, I think this one works no matter which one you say, but that seems to be the way that it hits. Okay. All right. Hopefully I made sense of the problem right though, as far as that. It sounds, that sounds right. All right. 37 to 40. Six. Write the absolute value function as a piecewise function. So I, I had mentioned a couple times, and like I said uh, in previous videos, in the previous video, that they can be piecewise functions. So y equals absolute value of x plus one. This also might help to draw these, not in this like big bad way, but just you know go like, all right, well here's my absolute value of x plus one. What's nice is if you practice this before, then you get some extra practice on it. You know how to do it. So the graph looks like that. So this has a slope of negative one over here and a slope of positive one here. So the, and the y-intercept here is one. So this piecewise function will be negative x plus one when x is, let's say, less than zero, and then positive x plus one when x is greater than or equal to zero. Now you're going to see the same slope, opposite slopes on both sides, one and negative one, two and negative two, one third and negative one third, whatever it is. And then the y-intercept isn't always going to be the vertex, though. So we'll see different changes there. Um, number 38, though, does have a vertex on the y-intercept. So absolute value of x minus 3. So that looks like down here at 3. The slope is still 1 and negative 1. So that one is going to be negative x minus 3 when x is less than 0 and positive, excuse me, positive x minus three when x is greater than or equal to zero. All right, so that's 37 and 38. Um, okay, 39 is gonna pose a little more of a challenge and I, I really do say that drawing these does help. In fact, let me use the graph thing for these. That's the best way if we can scale them. All right, uh, absolute value of x minus two. The minus two, I'm, I'm not gonna reteach absolute value things, but the minus two is your h right h is two so it's at two zero and then it goes up and over so as long as you get the idea and i should probably draw a little more scale because you want to know your y-intercept the slope is up one over one 
So it's crossing at two there. So what's important is when you write your piecewise function that to the left of, it's to the left and right of two this time, right? To the left of two, it behaves like negative x plus two, y equals negative x plus two. And then to the right of two, it behaves like y equals x minus two. So remember, you're extending to your y-intercept to see what it, where it crosses the y-axis there. Maybe I'll draw them better to scale next time. Maybe I'll use the line tool from now on. Okay, that one's a little rough. I'm sorry about that one. Let me be better for the next one. All right, number 40. Absolute value of x plus 5. All right, I have a line tool. You ready? I just need to get my colors. All right. Absolute value of x plus 5, that is right here, like that, it's pretty big and bold, and right here, like that, okay? So, to the left, keep in mind, I would have to extend this line here to figure out where it will cross the y-axis. It would cross at negative 5, so that would be your y-intercept for this part of the line. So, on one of these, this will be... Uh, negative x minus 5 when x is less than 5. You know what, this time I'll say less than or, or negative 5. This time I'll say less than or equal to because you might be asking why aren't you ever saying equal to on this first one. Oh, you can, so I will. And the other one is positive x plus 5 when x is greater than negative 5. Alright. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Alright, number 41. y equals 2 times the absolute value of x plus 3. And what's funny is we're not required to graph these, but it really helps. So, you know, they're not forcing you to, so I can't be mad at them that I choose to. But that was, might be what slows you down. At least you get some practice on graphs if you're going to do it again. All right, so, those, so that's the graph. That's that slope of 2, but 2 on one side, negative 2 on the other side. Uh, so to the left, if I kept going... It would hit here. Let's just let's simulate it. Down two over one, down two over one, down two over one. It would hit negative six. So on one part, we don't have to do domain and range, right? No. On one part, we have negative two x minus six. That's when x is less than or equal to negative three. And then positive two x plus six when x is greater than negative three. Uh, greater than negative three. Now, so far, because you might be asking. Mr. Robinson, do the signs just change each time? That's what we've seen so far. That's because we haven't shifted up or down with, so no, not always. When it's on the x-axis, yeah, maybe you can say that that's going to happen. But once you shift up or down, no, the y-intercepts won't be just opposite signs from each other. The slopes will be opposite signs. Y-intercepts will not be at that point. Uh, but for now, they will, up until we hit number 45. So 42... Uh, 4 times absolute value of x minus 1. So here and here. Let's see if we can get that just by looking at the graph. So that will be to the left. We have negative 4x plus 4. x is less than 1. And then 4x, this is going to be minus 4, when x is greater than or equal to 1. Number 43, we have negative 5 times x minus 8. So all the way over here. So down 5. Now this one I can't really use the graph for, so I'm going to have to use my mind. I mean, I can. I can get the idea and kind of see if it makes sense. All right, we're going to go down 5 over 1. Starting from 0, we're going to go down 5 8 times until we hit a y-intercept of, looks like, negative 40, right? 5 times 8. So your first equation there is, in, the slope is positive 5, though. That's a positive slope. So 5x minus 40 when x is uh, less than 8. And then slope of negative 5 here, I assume, it goes up to plus 40 here when it goes up 5 over 1 8 times when x is greater than equal to 8. All right, number 44. I keep forgetting what tools I need. 
All right, 44. Uh, negative 3 times absolute value of x plus 6. So this is to the left. Down 3 over 1. Same kind of thing as the last one. We can't really see it in the window range if we want to kind of use the graph, but get the idea. We have to go down 3 6 times, which gets us to negative 18. And then here we're going to go up 3 6 times, which gets us to positive 18. So this will be... On the left side, we got to go up three uh, six times, but then that's a positive three slope. So three x plus eighteen, when x is less than let's say or equal to negative six, and then negative three x minus eighteen when x is greater than negative six. All right, the last two we have h and k involved, and they won't just be opposite signs of the y-intercept. We'll see if they fit within the window range. I have no idea. So number forty-five, we got eleven problems to go. Number 45, we have um, 3, 2 as our vertex. The slope is negative 1, so it's a down 1 over 1, kind of like that, and down 1 over 1, kind of like that. And I'll be honest, you know, I already said we don't need to graph, so we don't even really need the graph itself, meaning, like, I just need the equation. I don't care about this being down 1 over 1. I actually care more about that way. Where does it, this isn't the graph, but where does it hit the y-axis is what I care about. I got to know the graph is going to go to the right, though, so maybe it is kind of important to have this. But what, what's more important, sorry, the arrow is kind of wrong, but I don't care. What's more important is where does it hit the y-axis, right? But to the left, let's start to the left there. This is um, y-intercept of negative 1, slope of 1. So x minus 1 when x is less than or equal to 3. And then negative x, you can see this is different now, 1, 2, 3, plus 5 negative x plus 5, different y-intercepts, when x is greater than 3. Okay. And last one, number 46, from this set. Whoops, let's do that again. Sorry. Last one, number 46. Um, 7, hold on, this went a little low. 7 times x plus one minus one. All right, so negative one, negative five, negative one, negative five there. And we're gonna go up seven over one. One, two, three, five, six, seven over one, like that. Then up seven over one here. All right, so there's the graph. Now, what's the piecewise function version? To the left is all this. The slope is negative seven. If we go down another seven and over one, that's gonna hit a y-intercept of negative 12. So, negative 7x, that is bad. Negative 7x minus 12, when x is less than negative 1. And then positive 7x, I think that's plus 2, when x is greater than or equal to negative 1. So those are the piecewise functions. I'm picking and choosing which ones I do the equal to and not equal to. There's no rhyme or reason for that that's required. Uh, either or is fine. It, it shouldn't be both, and it can't be neither. Um, it could kind of be both because it's the same value, but I wouldn't I wouldn't push that. Uh, modeling with mathematics. You are sitting on a boat on a lake. You can get a sunburn from the sunlight that hits you directly and also from the sunlight that reflects off the water. So if you can't tell, there's a kind of yellow sun ray right there. It bounces off the water. Boom. It can get you. Write an absolute value function that represents the path of the sunlight and then write a function as a piecewise function. So more of the absolute, this time they gave us the graph, which is nice. So the graph, it has a vertex at three, zero. H is three, K is zero. The slope is two, the A, um, vertical stretch factor is two. So this is F of X equals two times the absolute value of X minus three. That's that version. As a piecewise function, so that's part A. As a piecewise function, it would be to the left of 3, it's negative 2x plus 6. Uh, it shouldn't be a semicolon. x plus 6. x is left of 3. And then positive 2x, I guess minus 6. That y-intercept would hit uh, negative 6. 2x minus 6 when x is greater than or equal to 3. So they're just, I mean, yeah, that's it. Oh, oh. Um, I don't know if they want the graph to stop there. Hmm. I guess not, because they said write an absolute value function, and they don't mention anything else about domain and range. 
I guess it's good. It's possible. It's possible that we say because it hits this person here, and I don't know if there's any guarantee of knowing that it hits the person there, but of saying like x is less than four or something. I I don't think they want that. All right, let's keep moving on. Number forty-eight. You are trying to make a hole on hole in one on the miniature golf green. Okay. I have trouble with this in real life, but here we go. Write an absolute value function that represents the path of the golf ball. Okay, it's just more of the absolute value and write a piecewise function. So here we go. Uh, part A, the absolute value function. My H is six, K is four, and my A value is, we're going down two over three. It's an upside down, this reflects over the x-axis, so negative, and it's a two-thirds vertical compression factor. So this is, negative two thirds times the absolute value of x minus six plus four. Okay, but I get to kind of use the graph for part b as a piecewise function. All right, so to the left of six, when x is less than or equal to six, it's two thirds x, y equals two thirds x, it hits the origin. So two thirds x, and then it's negative two thirds x on this side, but the y-intercept it would hit up two over three, uh, that's six, and up two is eight, over three is eight. So negative two thirds x plus eight, when x is greater than six. All right, number 49. The piecewise function f consists of two linear pieces. The graph of f is shown. What is the value of f of negative 10? What is the value of f of eight? So instead of extrapolating what these are by counting down, down three over whatever, let's actually kind of make the equation and evaluate it from there. Let's go back to the first things we were doing from like problems three to 10 or whatever it was. So let's make a piecewise function. That'll be, the first one looks like, oh, that's weird. Okay, let's see, well, okay, right there. So boom, down one over two, or up one over two. So one half x plus one when we are left of three, which includes three, and to the right of three, it is up one over one. Uh, the y-intercept is negative two. So x minus two, when there. Now what we can do for f of negative 10 and f of eight is just make sure that we put it in the right spot. So f of negative 10, we're going to do it on the top one. One half of negative 10 is negative five, plus one is negative four, boom. So now we get the calculation. And then f of eight, that's greater than three. Eight minus two is six. Yeah, you could have counted and such, but I'm giving you the idea of what you can do from that. Okay. Um, number 50. Describe, let's see how far we are, an hour seven. Describe how the graph of each piecewise function changes when less than is replaced with greater than or equal to, do the domain and range change, explain. Okay, so they are, so they're saying, what if I take, I'm gonna kind of copy and paste these, give me one moment. So it sounds like they're saying, what would happen if you took what you see here, and anytime you see, oh, you less than you change to less than or equal to, let's see if I can find a way to erase that, and greater than or equal to, you change to a greater than, like that, and then same with this one here. Excuse me, this is boom, and this is boom. So compare what it looks like on one set versus the other. Okay, so let's let's look at them separately. So on A right here, they're asking you to do the domain and range. Oh, okay, so how do the graphs change? Because uh, I'm not gonna draw them. How do the graphs change? Closed circle versus open circle changes, unless unless uh, they are sharing the same y value. The closed and open circles change. Do the domain and range change? Domain shouldn't change. We're still hitting all real numbers here. Less than two, greater than two, and two is included. So domain shouldn't change. Range only changes based on the open and closed circle nature, possibly. Now these are very specific examples. So does this, domain, uh, does this range change on these ones? So I'm not gonna draw the graph in full, but let's get the idea of it. So on part A, on part A, if we did the original graph, uh, x plus two if x is less than two, 
Huh, I probably do have to get a good idea of this, huh? X is less than 2, X plus 2. So it would be open circle there, and then boom. And then negative X minus 1, X is greater than like that. Okay, so the original graph would have looked like this. Now if we change it, we go from open circle to closed circle, that does change it. That does change things. If this turns open, and if this turns closed, what the range was before, the range would have been y is less than 4. Now it's y is less than or equal to 4. So it changes because the open circle nature. So my, my bottom line idea is that if the open circle is the only time that that range would have been hit, then it will change because it goes from open to closed. But if this was the open circle, and then it turns into a closed circle, uh, no, that, no, um, yeah, no, it's still good. Uh, part B, let's check out part B. One half x plus three halves, if x is less than or equal to one, so it'd be kind of like a, like a, like a that kind of thing. Oh, if less than one to start with, right? So it'd be kind of like that. And then negative x plus 3, if x is greater than 1. Um, I hope they're not tricking me and saying that it's going to hit right on here. I, I feel like it will. x plus 3 halves. This, this might hit this twice. So, you know, I'm sorry for being cheap on the problem. I don't think I'm allowed to be. So let's, let's get a graph. Hold on. Okay, I'm gonna paste a graph in here. So I think this next one, they're kind of tricking you with it because I think they are going to hit the same value. So one half x plus three halves. Three halves is one and a half, which is right there. So if I go up one half over one, that's a point, and then any up one over two would work. Uh, but this does hit at one. So that's an open circle here. And then the other one is negative x plus three, and you see it does hit there as well. So that one's a little tricky as far as what they're asking. And I think this was something that I wanted to account for. So it kind of looks like that. Does it matter? Does it change if it switches? No. This is like those absolute value ones and whatever that we saw is that they're sharing the same exact value. So no, it doesn't change. So uh, domain doesn't change at all. So domain, no change. Range, change. <laughs> it goes from y is less than 4 to y is less than or equal to 4 the other way. Domain and range, no change on the next one. D, R, no change. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. Number 51, graph this. Describe the domain and range. Okay, the first part is negative X plus two if X is less than or equal to negative two. So here's plus two, uh, up one, left one, up one, left one, so here's the negative two, so. We're going to go like this. And then absolute value of x if x is greater than negative 2. So absolute value of x is just this guy like that here. And then on the other side, it would go. Remember, it only goes so far. It goes to this point here. There shouldn't be an arrow. But it goes to there, and then there's an open circle. Okay, describe the domain and range. Basically, just, just write out the inequalities of them. Um, domain is still all real numbers. Nothing changes there. The range, is that all they want? Yeah, the range is just y is greater than or equal to zero. Again, every y value is hit. You might say there's a jump there, but they're all hit right there. So that's it. All right, last uh, four problems, I think. Number 52. The graph shows the total cost C of making X photocopies at a, at a copy shop. Um, this is an interesting way to do it because if I run a hundred copies, I'm paying more than if I run a hundred one copy. Okay. Um, does it cost more to make? Oh, <laughs> that's exactly what they asked. All right. Does it cost more money to make a hundred photocopies or a hundred one photocopies? Explain. Uh, it costs more to make a hundred photocopies. So. A, it costs more to make 100 photocopies because uh, because the graph shows it. Because uh, let's see, how do I say that? Um, because the graph shows it. I mean, why do they logically do that? I have no idea. I don't know who would ever do that. You might as well run more because the graph 
shows higher y values on the step function. I don't, I, I don't really know how to best say that. I You can look at an answer key for that part. I don't know. You have $40 to make photocopies. Can you buy more than 500 photocopies? Explain. All right. So uh, at $40, you could get 500 copies dead even. They asked for, can you get more? Uh, yeah, more than at 501 copies, you could get, you know, like this $35 ish amount, kind of like that. And up until a point, right? Once you hit like 550, you know, like five, like 570 copies or something, then it's another $40 again. So, yeah, it, you know, yeah, there's a rough, I'm, they say explain. So, yes, because on, on the domain um, x greater than 500 there are certain parts, there are certain costs that stay under $40. That, that was probably a better explanation than my first one that I was trying. Um, I hope that that business understands what it's doing. All right, number 53. The output y of the greatest integer function is the greatest integer less than or equal to the input value of x. This function is written as that guy. So this is not an absolute value symbol right here. It is known as greatest integer function. So it says the output is the greatest integer less than or equal to the input value x. So what that means in this way is if x was 0.9, for example, here, let's say 1.9. If x was 1.9, what is the greatest integer that's less than or equal to that value? One. So if x is 1.9, the y value is just one. You know, um, if uh, un until x becomes two, until x becomes two, y doesn't get to be two. Uh, so this this is the way that you make step functions, for example. Uh, anyway, so graph the function for negative four to four domain on x. Is it a piecewise function or step function? Explain. So I, I'm already saying that yes, it is. It's both a piecewise and a step function. So here's what's going to happen. Um, and I'm going to start with the positives because some people have trouble seeing things as negative. Um, the the one thing I will state on this, never mind. This is fine. Okay. So at zero, when x is zero, y gets to be zero. That's fine. Because keep in mind, this kind of looks like it. It almost says f of x equals x. That's not true. But when x is something, y is supposed to be that something. So when x is zero, y is zero. And also, when x is one, y is one. And when x is two, y is two. When x is three, y is three. Uh, four doesn't seem to get to be included. Greatest integer less than less than or equal. Hold on. I just want to make sure that I'm saying this the, the right way. Less than or equal to. Yeah. Okay. And then there's nothing included right there. Okay. So here's what's going to happen. Y values are the up and down. X values are left and right. When X is one, Y is one. But between zero and one, it doesn't just connect the dots. As we go closer toward one on X, the X values get higher, like 0.5. When x is 0.5, the output y is the greatest integer less than or equal to 0.5. What's the greatest integer less than or equal to 0.5? Zero. So x, y is zero the entire time that x runs from zero to one up until you hit one, and then there's an open circle. And then you got x is 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, but the greatest integer less than or equal to those is one. That's why the y value is one there, and it goes there. And then it does the same thing here, like 2.6, but 2 is less than or equal to it, greatest integer, da da da, and moves on to there as well. Now, this isn't included on either set. I actually shouldn't have put an open circle here at all. The open circle is there on x equals 4. Okay, and then going the other direction, it just continues that. So I'm going to go ahead and continue the same thing, like that, all the way to negative 4. Okay, it's both a piecewise and step function. Uh, explain? No, <laughs> because because it looks like one. It has constant amounts. Uh, it doesn't have to be equal intervals, but they are constant amounts for each portion of this uh, piecewise function itself. Okay, two more questions. Explain why this does not represent a function. How can you redefine y so that it does represent a function? Well, what I'm already seeing is that there is that or equal to on both portions of this. So right here, you're looking at 
less than or equal to three and greater than or equal to three. And there are times, we've kind of talked about it, there are times where if it, they met at the same place, I guess that technically qualifies, but I would never do it for this very reason. So if you look at y equals two x minus two, it would look like this up till x is less than or equal to three like that. So boom. And then the other side, it's negative three if x is greater than or equal to three. So it looks like that. The problem is there are two defined values at three. There are two outputs for the same input. So the problem is there are two outputs, four and negative three, for the same input of three. That's a problem, that's not a function. One needs to be an open circle. Both can be open circles. It won't hit the entire domain that way, but both would need to be open circles. Both can be open circles, they can be a function. How can we define y so it represents a function? Make one of them an open circle, which means get rid of the or equal to's on one of these. So get rid of that, boom, and then you have a function. Okay. And the last question, number 55, make an argument, making an argument. During a nine hour snowstorm, it snows at a rate of one inch per hour for the first two hours, two inches per hour for the next six, and one inch per hour for the final hour. Write and graph a piecewise function. Da, da, da. Okay, I think I can use this for it because it seems to be within the window range. I just don't need to really include this area. So I'm only in the first quadrant. Uh, nine hour snowstorm, it snows at one inch per hour for the first two hours. So one inch every, so no snow yet. Uh, one inch after one hour, another inch after another hour. So we have this part. Two inches per hour for the next six hours. So two inches for a one hour, boom. Oh, this won't all fit. Okay, but that's the idea. And then one inch per hour for the final hour. So now another up one over one like that instead of up two over one. So that's kind of the idea. Okay. Um, let's, that's 12, 14, and then 15 here. Okay, hopefully that kind of makes sense. All right, um, that's part A. Part, oh, uh, is there a domain range or anything? Right and graph. Oh, right of piecewise function. So let's call this. So there are three portions to it. The first portion is y equals x, uh, 1x plus 0. So y equals x when x is greater than or equal to 0. And 0 counts as a part of it. And then it does 2x plus, let's down 2 over 1, down 2 over 1, uh, minus 2. 2x minus 2 when x is between 2, I'm sorry, I said x is greater than or equal to 0. I meant between 0 and 2 when x is between 0 and 2. And then from 2 up to the next 6 hours, up to 8, I guess. Up to 8, it does that. And then it's a y equals x equation again. But, oh, we need the y-intercept. This was at, what, 15? So, and that's 9 hours away. So when I go down 9 inches of snow, that's 6. So x plus 6. Go down 1 over 1, it'll hit a y-intercept of 6. From 8 to 9. And we include nine, it seems like, because that's part of it. Okay, so that can be a valid piecewise function in my eyes. Uh, your friend says 12 inches of snow accumulated during the storm. Is your friend correct? Explain. I believe 15 inches accumulated during the storm uh, because that's what I calculated. When I plug in nine into here, I'm going to get it. That's what I have on the graph. I'm trying to see where the 12 would come from unless I didn't calculate something correctly. Let's make sure two inches for the next six hours. Um... I don't know where it would come from for them, but if it rained, if it snowed two inches per hour for six hours in general, that would have only been 12 inches of snow. So my guess is maybe they plugged it into their, I don't really know what they would have done there. So I'm, um, no, no, your friend is not correct because the reasons that I stated. Okay, and that is the last one and that ought to do it for this one, guys. So thank you so much for watching. Um, Timestamps are down below in case you want to see anything else again. And I will be back for section 1.3. I don't know what it's on. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Take care. I will see you in the next one.